This is Primitive Outfitting, and you are listening to The Gritty Bowman. Bam, chicken, wow, wow. <laughs> bow, bow. Nice. <laughs> and I'm not standing on my high horse saying, I shoot a self-bow, because there's no way in hell I'm shooting a self-bow. <laughs> when I say that, I mean that in a good Christian way. As far as Cecil goes with me, I mean, I could really give a sh- crap about that lion too much. And all I was looking at was the tip of Aaron's arrow. <laughs> and it was like this and this, and then it was kind of shaking, and then it went... Boom, solid like a rock, and I'm like, oh, oh, oh. It- <laughs> and he's like, I gotta know if you hit anything or not. You never really show excitement, because I don't. I just, I'm yeah. kind of always mellow. And this thing, ready to jerk a tear. I was running around like an idiot. <laughs> Woo! You know, if you ever talk to anybody from Africa, they're all about hunting lines, because they eat people. Yeah. The compound, I have total confidence. With this thing, I'm like, hey, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but the way that America works, we're so soft, like, softer than baby all of us basically the uh the shooting errors i'm gonna call it matrix effect i panicked so that to me says alien (laughs) all right there's no animal that looks like that it was hot hot like i was i was sweating bad um like mark Furman at the million man march bad it was bad because north North idaho where perpetually chickens wear underwear so the hoot owls won't <laughs> rape them and i have a back with a crack right i have no butt and so rain gear <laughs> it was it was cold dude it, it's yes and i was not expecting it so i dressed <laughs> i dressed for balmy weather and uh that's not what we got oh, he farted once i heard it hit the ground <laughs> it was colder way colder than i had expected it to. yeah all right folks welcome to the gritty moment podcast we are launching in before Aaron and I just keep talking and don't start the podcast. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, I panicked. <laughs> yeah, we just did a show a couple of days back on uh, the our 2016 hunts and what they cost, and so how you can do them. And uh, we got a, a little bit of feedback on that podcast. Good stuff. Good stuff. We had a, a guy that commented. That we should clarify on. It gave some good good uh, info. I can tell you, Matt, now, if you should sit with your cross legs crossed like that, um, so Tony, when Tony Mudd is going to tell me that you are. Well, if you sit like this, it's not so bad. But, Aaron, you sit like this. My quads I can't are big, physically man. do. <laughs> My hang down gets in the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're going to have to edit that out. So, anyway, we did get some comments, some public, some private, yeah. about... One, we probably should have wrote, written things down about... Yeah. <laughs> and and so I started to research today. Um, I put about 20 solid minutes into researching the point system. I'm just going to tell you, go look at Eastman's MRS section and call the hunting fool or whoever you want to talk to. It's more effort yeah. than I honestly wanted to put into it. You can hunt over the counter in Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Idaho, Montana. Um, I'm probably missing yeah, some. Most, a lot of Western states. And then there's a point system for like New Mexico, um, uh, Arizona, Colorado. They all have point systems as well. Yeah. What we were trying to get across, we were kind of blanketing it, was you can afford to come and hunt out West if you budget for it. And most of them are realistic. You know, you can, yeah. you, you can make it. Now, we had one comment um, of a guy. I can't really remember if he said get real or – um no he just be said, realistic uh, maybe he said uh he broke down his cost traveling from philadelphia yeah to from philly to to colorado which he's done every year since 2008 which is awesome and uh so he broke down some costs and his revised estimates was thirty five was 3500 and we had said i can't remember but i know when i when i went from minnesota to colorado I had like 2300 into it, and, and that was in gear. And I already had some backpacking gear. But mm-hmm. if you figure, um, you know, ballpark 600 for the tags, if you take two guys, you're looking about 600, 300 each for fuel. Yeah, he was saying an out of state, non resident deer tag was 375. Right. And, uh, and an elk tag is, let's just do elk, yeah. roughly. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to round up because I think it's 575 for an elk tag, but yeah. 600 for a tag in Colorado. 300 each for fuel is is realistic if you got two guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I don't stay in a hotel normally. Like, you are worse than me. I made him stay in a hotel when we went to Idaho <laughs> because I had um, like some spending cash I'd budgeted I'm for that I'm so trip. cheap, dude. I, I yeah, have He went to sleep in the truck. I'm like, a, hell no. <laughs> I have a cot in the back of the, sleep, uh, the truck. 
and I was sleeping back. That's there 100 percent of the time. Yeah. So anytime I want to, I can pull over and just sleep in the back of my rig. And and I think like um, I just you, can't stand the thought of paying for a hotel. I can vouch for him with that. I'm like, no, dude, I'll get it. Don't worry. I want to sleep in a bed and I want to take a shower. Um, but if you figure 600 for the tag, 300 for fuel, I don't budget in a hotel room because I have a tent or I'll sleep in the truck uh, is one thing. And then you're looking at food. If you're crafty and you plan ahead, you can make your own food, uh, which will save you some money. But I would say if you budgeted in fifteen dollars a day for food, meaning you're backpacking food, yeah, yeah. to twenty um, on a ten day hunt, that's two hundred bucks, roughly. If you don't have great gear, just get tougher because, I mean, the guy had brought up the, the what it takes to do um, a backcountry hunt and backcountry gear. Now I'm the the biggest gear junkie on the planet, uh, so I'm all for you buying gear specifically by Kafaru, but. <laughs> Much, much tougher men than us did it with nothing, basically. Yeah. Mountain men, obviously, even in the 70s, Fred Bear. They, I mean, you just got to be tougher is what it boils down to. When I was on a much smaller budget and I didn't get free gear from everyone, um, I had like this camp trails thing that, um, you know, I had bought on, um, uh, I can't remember. I think I bought it at a, a Army Surplus store. It was like 20 bucks. Yeah. Uh, my budget was non-existent. So, you know... Were we exact on numbers? I don't know. 3,500 seems high, but I believe you can get to, you know, Colorado on an elk hunt from a state that's not Vermont, but close, uh, closer than Vermont. But either way, around $1,800 roughly if you are, if you're tight. I mean, don't spend beyond your means. Don't have champagne taste with a beer budget. You can get it done. Yeah. I remember um, with going with Cousin Ben uh in oregon yeah <clears throat> and of course you know we got our tags i think a 100 bucks for tags and license and everything because we're residents but it was a late season rifle hunt and it was basically a dr- over the counter or or one point draw yeah and we we literally borrowed guns from yeah. uh <laughs> neighbors and friends right yeah we got some bullets which we borrowed yeah. also <laughs> <laughs> and then we got a uh, tent from Walmart, and it was nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, and the, the the fly on the tent was about uh, three feet by three feet, but the tent was like five feet by five feet, <laughs> so the fly <laughs> was questionable at best. Uh, and um, and then we just brought some old sleeping bags and stuff, and we bombed up there, and we had, I think we bought uh, a loaf of bread and two a jar of peanut butter and jelly, and like 10 cans of chili and basically that's what we did and uh, i don't know that we spent you know more than 100 bucks each you know excluding tags in gas and supplies oh yeah and i i guess which we love the comments because it's always good to have multiple different opinions and it depends on what kind of hunt you want to have right i was just gonna say i would say be real tell that guy if he told me that in person was don't buy such expensive stuff. Like if you're poor, yeah, hunt poorly. I guess. Like if you want to have a plush, comfortable hunt with the newest, greatest gear, it's probably going to be expensive. Yeah, um, and that's great because that's kind of what we've been doing lately. But I'm also 42, and uh, I've spent. You know, I graduated from college. You know, <laughs> <laughs> more than 12, 15 years ago. Yeah, and uh, and I've. I've I'm, I'm, it's not like I'm 20 anymore, so yeah. I can afford some things. Well, and we're blessed with, obviously, we get a lot of cool gear for free to try out, to test, prototype stuff, um, you know, promote the whole nine yards. So, you know, we're, we're spoiled now in, the, in that sense. And But I would say, though, I mean, we're not exactly, I mean, Brian and I don't make a lot of money. Um, I mean, we do okay, yeah. right? But it's not like, I, mean, I can tell you right now, Brian argued with me for quite some time <laughs> on the way back and to idaho about a hotel and i'm like dude i'll get it like <laughs> it's not that it's 69 bucks we'll stay in the shit hole. i don't care but i want a bed so it's not uh, that big of a deal but one of the things um you know kind of covering that you know <clears throat> we should have done a little bit more research on the point system honestly it's more research than i want to do at this time um i think that 3500 is a little on the high end to to come to Colorado. but if you're traveling all the way from philadelphia that's it, different 
come on, than yeah. if you're traveling from uh, two states away or one state away. Oh, yeah. You're going to have to add it fuel. I was thinking about that. That 17-hour drive that we took to Idaho, northern Idaho, well, if that's if that costs us, you know, four or five hundred bucks in fuel, well, if you're going three times that distance, well, it's fifteen hundred dollars in fuel or twelve hundred in fuel. So I figured it out you know? um, roughly from uh, it'd be about four hundred dollars each in fuel from uh, Pennsylvania here, if I figured out okay. it correctly. Because I, I didn't want, I, I honestly, I didn't want to give out too much misinformation. But if you're driving driving something that gets ten miles to the gallon. That skews it a little bit. Um, right. You've got to drive what you have. But it's definitely... Um, the point is that it's doable. Yeah. It's, it really it's is for, for mostly any budget. And we encourage people to come out and especially those e- those East Coast guys that want to do a mountain hunt, do it. Yeah. Don't, don't be scared. Get the gear that... The best gear that you can afford and, and be as budget-minded as possible. Start early. Even like the food. Mm-hmm. I mean... Start early with the food. I, and th- this is coming from two guys with a <laughs> – we have been poor for – off and on for quite some time yeah. and got it – figured it out and got it done. Um, it's not easy hunting out of state, but it is it is doable. But one of the things that that, that comment had made about the guy uh, for coming from Pennsylvania was gear. Um, yeah. And Be- – Before you go there, yeah, I wanted to just make another comment. Someone had mentioned the bear hunt for Prince of Wales or Alaska in general. And something that I am loathe to mention on this podcast, but because it competes with my desire to serve the gritty community <laughs> and then the desire to take care of myself. And that is that the deadline to apply for Alaska is just in a, like December, I don't know. It's, it's in a week or so. Make sure and vote on November 19th or whatever that is. <laughs> so basically the wrong dates. I'm telling you. No. <laughs> yeah. You should go check. But I believe, uh, so if you want to apply, for example, to Prince of Wales yeah, for 2018, spring 2018, you have to apply now. Gotcha. Like in the next few days. I will not be attending that race because I don't like the rain. But that's um, the same as if you want to hunt all the way in... Alaska, you know, out of Juneau or whatever. Yeah. It's the same deadline to apply. So uh, get in in on that if you want to. And if you want to learn more about Prince of Wales bear hunting, because I have a few people mention it, uh, episode 12 and episode 126 of the Gritty Bowman podcast, we share our experience of hunting Prince of Wales Island for black bear and all and we go into details on the ferry ride. There's quite a bit of video. So if you want to. I would recommend watching it because then you can kind of follow along with our hunt in video as well and see it. But, uh, if you want to see what the elk hunt in Colorado is like, I don't remember what episode it is, but there's a five part episode, four part of Aaron, uh, hunting Colorado. And that's pretty much your, like what your over the counter hunt would be like. Yeah, pretty much. And I think, uh, you know, as long as you set your, you know, what kind of hunt you want, realistic expectations. Um, I, I, you know, you can have a fun hunt. Um, oh, yeah. Definitely not guaranteed you're going to gonna get anything. And, and I, I'm, I, we, specifically me, for the last few, I'm from, you know, I'm not from Colorado, but um, I may not have a lot of money, but I have a lot of time in the field. So that helps uh, too. Yeah. But, uh, but the gentleman who mentioned the, you know, his cost of traveling from Philadelphia, you know, brought up the gear issue. Yeah. Uh, you know, clothing you know, specifically. That's gear. where a lot of people spend a lot of money is clothing. Clothing. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, you've got boots, packs, clothing, your weapon. I mean, yeah. But it, it can get expensive, but it made me think, and this isn't going to be a budget minded podcast section here. Uh, this is going to be a clothing specific, um, backtrack a little bit. One thing I have found is um, when you're getting advice on clothing from people, it can be extremely skewed one direction or another depending upon where the person's from. So if a guy's from um, Oregon, he may cater a little bit more to the uh, uh, wet weather aspect of things. Where if a guy's from Colorado or parts of Idaho or whatever, he's going to cater maybe more to the lightweight because, you know, specifically in Colorado, 
oxygen is uh, at a premium. And so you're trying to save weight. So he may give you some directions that don't include a lot of wet weather type stuff, uh, which you may need. So anyway, we're going to go over the clothing systems um, that we had used or would use or would suggest for the different hunts that we went on this year, as well as other hunts we've we've been on. Um, and we'll kind of knock it from um, in a row. And since it's <coughs> Brian and I, there's going to be some squirrels involved in the middle of that, but we'll start with Colorado. Yeah. Um, the one thing I will say, and we've talked about this before, but with Colorado, not a lot of underbrush and not a lot of rain. Um, so, although we did experience a lot of rain while we were here. Dude, that first week was, we got the snow and the ice yeah. and the wind. It was, it was cold, dude. It, it's, yes. And I was not expecting it, so I dressed, <laughs> I dressed for balmy weather and uh that's not what we got he farted once i heard it hit the ground (laughs) it was colder way colder than i had expected it to be um but i i would uh i would say with colorado you generally don't have to worry about wet weather as much there's no underbrush lightweight is going to probably favor a little more uh heavy uh, lightweight gear compared to uh maybe more durable gear um it's dry uh, yeah, exactly. And so with what we went in was a pretty basic system. We'll go over the uh, the first light gear we actually used, and then we'll go into some options from some other companies as well as, as, well as um, budget-friendly companies. Yeah. So with, with what I went in this year, we didn't hike in that far. Um, we were only, I say only, but three and a half miles up to four and a half, relatively easy terrain, um, <clears throat> a about ten and a half to eleven and a half thousand feet. See, there's the issue right there. <laughs> like Aaron makes it sound like it was just a jaunt. Uh, I, coming from you know a uh, hundred foot sea level life, uh, it's been a bit of an adjustment. <laughs> I mean, you know, some guys have like calves built for dunking, and other guys have you know a chest and arms built for bench press. <laughs> I have lungs built for high altitude, um, and not really like a bragging thing it's no, just it's, i have noticed that i don't i'm not i'm not prone to altitude sickness um i my know, pace doesn't slow and and i'll say this like i i am prone to altitude sickness it really sucks because i don't want that to be a problem but, oh, i've had uh, guys wanting to cut their freaking head off it hurts so bad yeah and there, you, you, the only way to fix it is drop altitude like it, it's the only way and we went to uh when i was with pinch we we're on this buck that's another podcast. But anyway, I climbed about 2,000 feet, vertical feet, and dropped 2,000 feet <clears throat> over a few miles. And then I hiked back 2,000 feet in one day and back down. Did you get a headache? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so I did that two days in a row. And then I drove straight from there to Winter Park, mm-hmm. from the hunt to Winter Park to hang, to be with my family for a few days. Uh, all, all of Suzanne's extended family went up there, and <clears throat> we did a little thing for Thanksgiving. This was the squirrel I was talking about, by the way, but go ahead. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, we were at 9,500 feet. Now, in Evergreen, I think I'm at 8,300 feet, Yeah, and I'm pretty darn good now at 8,300. Yeah. Like, I sleep like a champ. I feel good. I can run up the hills, right? Yeah. But those abrupt changes in altitude that, that in one, from, you know, within hours – you know, climbing 2000 vertical feet when I'm already at 8,000 feet, mm-hmm. that to up to 10,000, it just, it really makes me uh, short of breath. Oh yeah. And when we went to winter park, uh, for three days, I could not sleep. I just laid there and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I just kept, I just couldn't go to sleep and insomnia is a problem with, um, you know, with, high altitude sickness well it's good brian is bringing this up because every um everywhere you hunt has a different problem basically Mm -hmm. i mean it's got it's got some kind of a of a migration barrier in the way for your hunting success and so altitude if you haven't experienced high altitude you have no strength in your legs you have no strength in your body you have no energy you generally have a headache and so with colorado in my case, we were at low altitude. I didn't care what I brought, so I threw in a soft shell. But Brian, he carried a little bit different stuff. So for me, um, the first trip in, I had 
the first light guide pants. Um, I had a, a Lano or Yano. Uh, no, I didn't. I, yeah, I had a Yano uh, zip neck. And then I had the fleece from first light. I had the uh, puffy, the uh, Cirrus, the lightweight puffy jacket, mm -hmm. their lightweight rain gear, rain top, <clears throat> and no rain pants. Yeah. The second trip, I had all of the exact same things, except I had uh, Piranha Zion pants or Cool Renegades. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, um, if I'm going to hunt in Colorado and I'm going to hunt below tree line, um, really the only thing that changes above tree line, I throw an extra layer in basically or, or whatever. But I'm generally going to either run Cool Renegades, Piranha Zions, the first light guides, uh, Sitka ascent, Sitka mountain pants, and, and b before I go too far, this is in September. Uh, in September, uh, Sitka mountain pants, um, the Kuyu guides. I don't wear Kuyu, but Kuyu guide pants is a good pant. Those are the pants that I would suggest. Um, if you get into something like the Sitka Timberline, for me, it's too hot in September. Their mountain pants um, are about as hot warm as like the the first light guide uh, mm -hmm. pants, the Corrigate guide. Those are the, my pants. No long johns, no puffy pants, no nothing. And then for the top, I wear a sleeveless T-shirt generally, uh, World's Okayest Hunter, the Wham Sauce shirt, Support Rock Slide and Gritty Bowman. And then I'll wear like a, a long sleeve camo like the, the, the Yano or the Lano for my, for my hunting shirt throughout the day. Long sleeve, lightweight merino. I usually have that, um, some kind of a fleece, mm -hmm. a puffy, and a rain jacket. Now... I wore that soft shell quite a bit this year because it just wasn't that far from me. Brian basically had the exact same gear, except you had two puffies, didn't you? Well, I wore things. I just, Aaron can climb a mountain, and like like he said, you know, he just doesn't get winded. I'm slightly feeling like I'm jogging to keep up, like, and I sweat. You sweat, yeah. That's I sweat difference. right off the bat with a, with a little bit of exertion. I'm already, like, sweating. I can wear, like, three layers and... Yeah, swear. Aaron will be wearing like uh, his, all three of his warm layers, and he will be not when he won't sweat. We'll climb the top of the mountain. By the time we get to the top, I'm in a t-shirt, and that's it. Yeah, and I, and so I have to shed clothes, and I have to put clothes on to really regulate my temperature a lot more than Aaron does. So especially if I'm trying to keep pace, like if I go my pace, I can go all day long, but. Aaron will beat me to the top by at least 300 yards, uh, maybe more. <laughs> so it can happen. Uh -huh. uh, so to keep pace with Aaron, I <clears throat> I find myself just sweating. So and it's in the the layer system is huge that you bring that up. Now me, I don't have to use layers as much. I am a layer guy, like people mention it all the time, because I'll have f several different layers rather than one or yeah. one primary. Now when I go into higher altitude. It starts to get into that one layer, or not one layer for the entire system, but I may go from five or six layers to three when I'm at higher altitude and colder weather, and I'll go over that in a minute. Yeah. Um, now, we went... I'm just going to say, my favorite setup is the Chama hoodie. Yeah. T-shirt and a Chama hoodie. I, I like that. I can quickly scrunch up the sleeves, so it's like a short sleeve, right? I can put the hood on or off to, sh to cool myself. And I usually, I'm a vest guy. I wear vests. I, wear, I love a vest because a vest seems to keep me warm yeah, but cool. So I can exert a ton of energy. But because my arms are out and exposed and everything, I, I don't have to take it on and off. Yeah, uh, it's, it's ideal for me. So I've been wearing vests for 10 years. So I wear the first light vest with the Chama hoodie. I wear a pair of gloves and a beanie. And then quickly, if I'm getting too warm, I shed the gloves, I shed the beanie. And as I keep climbing, I shed the hood. And if I need to, I unzip the vest. But pretty much, I um, and I really don't like wearing long johns at all. I just, so I pretty much, from the waist down, it's a one layer pant. And I usually just wear the corrugate guide pant. If I'm trying to be quiet, then I'll wear, I wore the, uh, the canabs, the wool pants, first slice wool pants. Uh, that that seemed to be the ideal kind of uh, setup for me, and then I always had uh, either the the first light parka or some kind of puffy. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. You I might a wear the Kafaru one when it's really cold. Yeah, um, I wore the first light or the Kafaru parka 
probably nine out of ten hunts. Yeah, you had it on a lot, and that jacket's war- it's it's extremely warm jacket. Now you're not getting any style points with it. it. No, well, but if <laughs> Stay Puffs a style point, you're nailing it. Like drop but the it, mic, walk it's, away. It's got that giant um, on the bottom. It's got the giant uh, canvas. Yeah, yeah. So you can low crawl. Yeah, yeah, and then on the sleeves. And when we were in Alberta, and I was freezing to death on a couple of those days where it was really early, and I'm crawling through the cactus. Uh, that helped a lot. Yeah. And when I wasn't using that, it was brutal. Well, when we built that jacket, we tried to make it a little cooler than the older one, but we really just made it to not die. Like <laughs> It's bomb proof. We, we tried to make it. It's hard. Uh, in a puffy jacket, I will say, it's hard to have warmth, durability, and a cool factor. And if you're already fat, you're going to look fatter. And if you're skinny, you're going to look fatter than you should. Because Brian is pretty buff. He looks fat in a puffy <laughs> jacket. And he's commented on it. In the mirror, like, this jacket makes me look fat. And I don't even look because I know that I'm going to look fat. I have video of us, uh, me and you and John Pinch, up on the mountain glassing. Oh, Lordy. You three look kind of studly. I'm wearing the uh, the, the parka, and I got the, the, the hoods puffed out at the top. And I couldn't see myself in a mirror. But uh, I was ready to forgo all my fashion points <laughs> to stay warm. But I will tell you that I was comfortable for hours and then with a Kafaru, uh, which is another thing to bring up, the, the Kafaru mm-hmm. Wubi, with the Kafaru Parka, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty bomb-proof duo for freezing cold weather and glassing. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about that more as we go through the, the systems. But I think, um, and I'm sure I'm trying to be as open about different clothing systems just because I've got so many questions on you know, different systems. The one thing to look at, whether it's September, October, November, the, on the puffy jacket side of things, you've got a few different options, but the, you've got down and synthetic, which we've talked about, and then you've got more of a durable or a lightweight to simplify things. Now, with the Kafaru jacket compared to, let's say, I've got a, a Brooks Range Mountaineering uh, jacket. The Brooks, Rate Mount, Brooks Range Mountaineering is 900 fill. It's, it's cl- made for climbing Everest, extremely warm. Um, but you will rip holes in that thing like it's its job. It is not a durable outer, you know, the, the microfiber layer is not durable, um, but it is extremely warm, and it's it's six ounces lighter than the Kafaru jacket. Now, with the Kafaru jacket, um, neither one of them do you, are you going to look cool in. The Kafaru jacket, it's made for durability, warmth, bomb-proof. There's a weight penalty because it's synthetic. The one thing I think is is important to remember is everyone should have some type of a puffy or some people hate the name puffy jacket. Some people should have some type of a down or synthetic insulating, insulating jacket layer in their pack at all times, any time of the year. It's a lifesaver. Um, it's so lightweight, collapsible. It's kind of and and so efficient in keeping you warm. It's kind of a no brainer. Yep. Yeah, it is. So that's. Pretty much what we, well, when we killed, we almost had identical stuff on. When we killed my bull, um, I had the soft shell from First Light. It was a cold morning. I also had uh, the Halstead fleece. I had a Chama hoodie, and then I just had a regular T-shirt on under that, um, and then that, that beanie hat. You had basically the same thing, except you had a puffy. The vest. Yeah. Like, that's the one difference between Aaron and I is I I super rely on and use a vest every time, and Aaron doesn't. And now that's not totally true. What it is, in the spirit of full candor, I do not look good in the first light vest, so I don't wear it. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. there is that. I don't know that I look good in it either, uh, but but I definitely feel like it's the shoulders, dude. It looks like my shoulders giving birth. It just doesn't fit. The, it fits other people well. Yeah. It just doesn't fit me that well. Well, I uh, th- that's good to know because I sit here and I put it on, and it's like, man, it's so efficient in terms of. Like I can run up the mountain, and and just jack up the sleeves and stuff. And I am, st- I, with my backpack on. If I were dressed like Aaron with a Halstead fleece and and the things he was wearing, and and he does, he runs up there. I would be drenched. Well, I was in shaking that up. like a dog shit in peach pits <laughs> after I shot my elk. How cold it was! Like I was already emotional from the whole. <laughs> Delio, and then I'm like, <laughs> you were cold. cold. I was cold, and I didn't. Your nose sw- was running. Yeah, my nose runs all the time. It's bad, and and the nose thing is just literally 
I mean, something I can't, no matter what, my nose runs like crazy. Um, but so after that hunt, well, my mule deer hunt, which you weren't on. Uh-huh. Um, that was windy. I was, I was, yeah, I was also 80 degrees. <laughs> I was in a sleeveless world's okayest hunter t-shirt for two hours and 50 minutes um, with cool renegade pants on. And then for the last 10 minutes, I put a, uh, the Lano zip crew. No, I had the, uh, the new arrow wool zip crew for the last 10 minutes because that's when I stocked in on it. Mm-hmm. It was hot, hot. Like I was, I was sweating bad. Um, like Mark Furman at the million man March bad. It was bad. Cause <laughs> I, literally 80 degrees when, when I was, when I shot that deer. <clears throat> um, and that's Colorado mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. that same spot two days later, it was 38 degrees. Um, well, it got up to 44, but basically complete shift. It rained. It was pissing rain. We had bluebird skies. It was just hot as could be. We had to get the meat out quick. Yeah. So that doesn't really count. But then we went to Idaho, and we went from um, relatively high elevation yep. to Dry. low elevation. Relatively. I mean, it rained and snowed on us a little bit, but still the sun came out and everything was bone dry again. Where we went to... Uh, Coeur d'Alene. North, North Idaho, where Perpetually. The chickens wear underwear so the hoot owls <laughs> won't rape them. And I, underbrush everywhere. You can't walk anywhere. Uh, there was there was at one point in time when we were hiking out, uh, I believe I navigated poorly that day, <laughs> uh, both in and out. In and out. <laughs> uh, yeah, the in was what was killing me because it was straight up vertical. And I have a horrible time. I just... It is bad with me because when I <laughs> go the wrong way and it's steep, in my mind, I'm like, ah, it's a good workout. <laughs> Not everyone looks at things that way, I found. Uh, Brian didn't yell at me, but I don't think he was thrilled. And uh, I just, Well, we were we were relying on Ryan Avery's directions. He's like, go down to that stump and you kind of take a left and there's a trail and you go up the hill and then you take a left and right. stick trees. I kind of screwed that up from the gate. I left it way too early. So... <clears throat> but it rained about 15 minutes in to that day mm-hmm. for the entire day. No amount of rain gear was keeping it out. I was so wet when we got back. I remember Tan- I was thinking because Tanya was in the tent yep. um, when we got back, and I knew I was going to need to strip down. I was so wet, I crossed the river up to the hang down and didn't get any wetter. Right. That's as wet as I was, and he... Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, and in full candor, I was wearing my crispy Nevadas. Yeah. And you were wearing your crispy prototypes. Yep. And something went haywire with the prototype. Yep. They they created those boots in like two weeks and sent them to you. Yeah. So they had a minor, minor, major leak. <laughs> and so your feet were wet. I had. In your whole body. I had webs between my toes by the time that day was over. My feet were bone dry. And. Uh, I had the Kifar, or the first light uh, rain jacket on, mm-hmm. and I was bone dry under that. Um, but from the waist down and from the ankles up, I was soaking wet. And I think what happened with Brian being um, dry is not saying Brian wouldn't have, whatever. I was leading that day, busting water yes. off. That definitely caused more issues for me. But it's the brush hitting you while it's wet. I was walking around and I was hitting everything with this trekking pole as well before I hit it. I was after more of you an went all go, it. no quit guy, I just <laughs> blew through it. But it's so thick in North Idaho. You take three steps, and we talked about this on the podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dwight Shu said, "Hunting North Idaho, if you can stand at a fifty-story building and put an elk on top, and go up the flights of stairs, and every third step." Have someone smack you in the face with a branch, and every fifth step, have when someone throw a bucket of water in your face. Mm-hmm. That's North Idaho. Yeah. That was that day. Um, I was so wet. Luckily, <clears throat> Tanya and I are special friends. I was like, hey, hop out of here. I'm going to strip down to the undies. And then I got to my undies, and I'm like, what's so the I point? Threw, <laughs> yeah, I threw on dry underwear and wrung my underwear out, wrung everything I had out. And that fi- we burnt that fire all night, and that stuff still wasn't dry. Yeah. Um, it reminded so, me of, uh, you know, the co- Oregon coast. Oh, and that's why I don't. But colder. The Oregon coast. It, and that was another thing. It was when we got up to where the, the elk were, uh-huh. um, we hit, what, probably 30 mile an hour winds. Well, and I'm used to being wet in Oregon. 
but even when it's wet, it's 60, 50 degrees. It's, it's still warm. Yeah. Even though it's wet. North Idaho was the same level of wet, but with frigid coldness. Right. Right. 40s, 30s. Well, I was just going to say, we basically brought the same stuff to North (laughs) Idaho that we had in Colorado. What I would have done, um, number one is, uh, two sets of boots. No matter what they are, I would have had two sets of boots. And I brought two sets. I brought the Summit and the Nevadas, and they would get soaked on the outside, yep. but not penetrate to the inside. Yeah. So uh, what I'd never quite noticed or realized before was how cold your foot can be, yeah. even if it's dry, and you're, but you're putting on a, a very wet outer boot. Right. That makes a that was cold. Huge difference. Yeah. I was really surprised, especially when it's thirty degrees outside and there's frost on everything and it it's icing a little bit. And then you put that boot on in the morning. Yeah, it was cold, so it was really nice to have a couple pairs of boots. So while one was drying in the wall tent with the fire, I had a fresh pair of warm boots yep. put on. And I, I mean, I would say if I was going to change anything, I would have worn the lightest weight pant I probably could have to dry quicker. Uh, especially if we were for me and then i would have had a thicker hardcore set of rain pants uh and then i would have wore gaiters every day there's a couple days where we took off without gaiters on um that was a piss poor decision because it rained shortly after we left and my gaiters were at camp which is just a mistake (coughs) but i would have worn the lightest weight pant i could have two brought two sets of boots Gators every time a super heavyweight set of rain gear bottoms a heavyweight set of rain gear top and basically, everything underneath would have been what we brought to Colorado. Just yeah. base layer, you know, puffy jacket, that kind of stuff. One thing that uh, saved me on every hunt so far, like, and I'll go back to it again, is that Kafaru Parka. I just stuffed that in the bottom of my bag. And then if I got to a position where I was just freezing to death, I pull that thing out and slip it on, and I am warm pretty quick. It's basically quick. you're putting on a sleeping bag. It's what we make our sleeping bag out of. And when I put it on, uh, I was immediately... I dry out under, I'd wet clothes underneath. Yeah. And after about an hour of sitting, uh, glassing or whatever, I would be drying my clothes out inside. And yeah. I, what was cool was even when the jacket got really wet, it still seemed to work. Yeah. Oh yeah. When it's soaking wet, it still works. And I mean, we had a base camp there and then you and I stayed a couple nights, a couple one nighters out. Spike camp. Um, yeah. Spiked out. <clears throat> um, so w- really, very, very waterproof, very durable rain gear is key for North Idaho. Now, we went gators. from gators. I, now, Ryan Avery lives up there, um, which I always wondered how he ripped so many pants out. He's not exactly uh, – he's vertically challenged slightly. <laughs> um, he may not be the most flexible individual on the planet, and so I don't know that his leg is making it all the way over the logs, and he's probably – rubbing like stobs or whatever you want to call them <laughs> or he may combat roll under the log but he rips the crotch out and the inside pant leg of every set of yeah. pants he has and coming from colorado i'm like man what are you what are you doing and then yeah. i started hunting north idaho and i'm like oh that makes perfect sense there's so, so much undergrowth and the great the gators even though he doesn't like them the gators are a big help i like gators. he also wore quite often um head to toe Heavy duty uh, first light rain gear all the time, all day, yep, yeah, all day. Yep. Which I I don't like wearing rain gear from the waist down. Well, I kind of kinda prefer getting wet. I have a back with a crack, right? I have no butt, and so rain gear <laughs> from that's the, a that's a the, beautiful image. Thank you. Yeah, but rain gear does not stay up overly well. Any set of rain gear for me, and I'm not a big suspenders fan, so. Uh, I look like Maynard the mayonnaise farmer. (laughs) But that's Um, what Avery's relying on is the suspenders. He can pull it off, though. I just (laughs) – maybe I could – I just need someone to say, you look good. And I'm like, all right, I must look good. I'm going to go. But uh, when we went from – Because looking good matters. Yeah. Yeah. If it it, – what's your shirt say? If it makes you feel good, put it on. Put it on, yeah. (laughs) It is amazing to me, uh, the mental psyche of of hunting. I mean – what did Landers say? You got to have confidence when you walk into the dance that's, floor? That's right. I think it, it's important to, to feel like you look good. I mean. It, I, it does matter. It, it definitely helps your confidence. It matters less when you're freezing to death and all you care about is getting warm. But it, Well, I just posted that uh, uh, deal on Instagram where the guy's like, 
man, it doesn't look very warm, but, but, but damn, I look <laughs> good in this thing. And then it's got him frozen to death, and then it's got the police. Looks like he froze to death, and then the other cop says, yeah, but he looks good, though, and he's laying there dead. I try to, like the Swazi stuff, uh-huh. is a unique mountain man-esque look, not the most flattering. It, but it's yeah. How do you describe it? Like you look like Swiss Miss. Yeah, and uh, Grizzly Adams. <laughs> and what's the dude? Uh, you look like Legolas. Little House on the Prairie. with the hood and stuff, and I don't have the hair. It's little got House the little skirt the thing on the jacket. Looks yeah. like, it's but kinda, it, it it's like a little <laughs> dainty woodsman dress. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I've got that Grantford Brooks axe, so I can pull it off. <laughs> but. Uh, it is it is hard to look to stay warm and look cool. Um and 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 it, and truly in Colorado a lot of times I have to get in my sleeping bag on the side of the mountain in glass on a backpack hunt to stay warm enough I lose feeling in my hands and my feet. I've just learned to adapt. Hot hands, external heat sources are important. Which clothing brand have you seen where where people look good in the super warm ultra warm gear? Oh, that's a tough one. Um I mean, man, I'm. No, I can't even say because I'm going to piss people off. I don't want to <laughs> do it. That's what you do. You you piss people off. I, that's, yeah, I that's your mo. I don't. You know what? I will say Western Mountaineering keeping hunting brands out of it. You, Western Mountaineering looks pretty good. Mont Bell's got a good puffy jacket. Yeah. The problem is, um, if you what about it, Under Armour? Negative. Dude, no. Cameron Haynes, he's pretty sexy when he's wearing his. Uh, <laughs> But he's built for that, right? I have to work harder <laughs> than Cam does, right? I mean, what about some no, of those Sitka guys? The yeah, there's well, Adam Foss is the size of my leg. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I like Adam, but he is not exactly a towering giant. Uh, have you met Adam? Uh. Uh-uh. Him and Stephen Drake. W- they look are lean. Not big men. Yeah. Um. I mean, and and, <clears throat> and Cameron, you couldn't make him look fat. I mean, I mean, you try, right? Uh. <laughs> But when you get a little girthier or bigger, I mean, that's one thing. If you take a small guy and you put him behind a 165 deer and yeah. you let me photograph him, <laughs> I'll turn that thing 195 all day long. <laughs> no wide angle lens is going to fix me behind the rack. I can't get back far enough to make it look bigger. I've got a head, that, I mean, the side, like a bastard rat. So there's nothing I can do. <laughs> Same with puffy jacket. Yeah. There's just not much. And you're broad chested, so you get kind of the V thing going with the tail of the jacket. Yeah, which you've commented on. So yeah. there's there's not a whole lot you could do. I would just say experiment and try it on and see what makes you feel confident and wear that one. So uh, aside from the looks, though, performance wise, um, let's say we're looking at technical quality of garment, like how well it's performing, and we haven't used everything this year because. Um, you know, we're working with first light and, yeah. and so we've, we've heavily used most of their products and their stuff is very, it was very good. Yeah. Yeah. So now for me on the first light note, I had better luck with two, uh, I, I don't know if it's pronounced Cirrus or whatever, but mm-hmm. they're lightweight. I had better luck wearing two Cirrus jackets rather than an, an Uncompadre or the unpronounceable. I wore a large and an extra large and doubled up on their lightweight jacket and their insulating that. layer lightweight jacket. Yep. Rather than using their their single, yeah, uh, big puffy, big puffy. I wore which I was talking to Ryan at first light about that. I had better luck with that, and then the uh, the Chama hoodie or the Corrugate uh, fleece um, or the Halstead fleece or doubling up Halstead fleece and then the the um, Chama hoodie two puffies. Mm-hmm. I had better luck with that. The other option, um, the other option that you can also, uh, you know, do is, is 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 if you're on a budget, you can look at mountaineering clothing. Um, First Descent from Eddie Bauer, they have insane sales and they make a great puffy. Mont Bell, Western Mountaineering. Um, there's multiple companies that make great puffies. When you start to look at, um, without starting the the bash hater thing, when you start to look at Sitka or Kuyu companies like that, Cryptek. Um, uh, Sitka makes like a Kelvin, a Kelvin light, uh, Kelvin down. Um, the Kelvin down hoodie is extremely warm. Uh, and then they, they have the, the, um, Yukon. Yeah. The Yukon from, from Kuyu. And that's a good jacket as well. Now I'm, 
personally probably biased. I have not found a better jacket for extreme uh, terrain or extreme conditions than the 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 Kafaru jacket. Now I designed it. I'm going to say that that goes up until a point of a certain level of of coldness. When you hit is coldness a word? Yeah, sure. That's a, that may be a George Bush word, uh, but once you hit a certain level, down's a better option. There's there's no way around it. Once you get so cold, you don't have to worry about the down getting wet because everything's frozen, and then you want to get like a 900 fill, um, you know, heavyweight down jacket. Now it's like the equivalent of wearing four sleeping bags. Pretty much that Brooks Range mountaineering jacket. Mm-hmm. Um, Most ca- of us. You know, when we hunt, we're not getting into those kind of conditions. No, I it's mean. more mountaineering. I, I mean, thought we were going to be on that fourth season hunt. Yeah. It ended up being 65 a couple of days. But um, but either way. It was uh, nine degrees one morning. And I was cold. Yeah, it was. It the was, wind was We sat brutal. there for four hours. Um, but so anyway, I would say as far as performance, the Kelvin series from Sitka, uh Double up on uh, the Cirrus jackets from First Light or a, a Cirrus and an Uncompadre uh, for, for staying really warm. And then you can be versatile with it. If it's warmer, bring one jacket. If it's colder, bring both, whatever. Um, I'm not overly familiar with the newest Kuyu stuff for the simple fact they don't like me and I don't really like them. But they make good clothing. That Yukon is a great jacket. Uh, when you look at like a... <coughs> A, what is it, a nano puff or a micro puff from Patagonia. Um, some of those jackets, that's something you take on a day hike. It's not yeah. going to probably keep you alive in extreme. Arcteryx or whatever. Yeah. I, I just think, though, at the end of the day, I'd rather support hunting specific companies. Yeah, I mean, it's better to do that for sure. <clears throat> um, the thing that I th- that I think people don't, they buy too much stuff. You need to buy a system that works for you. And stick with with that system. I'm not saying the layering system. The it's, layering system. It's a it's awesome. I mean, like I know for, through experimenting now, you know, kind of the ideal uh, system that I like to wear that works for me. Well, and I mean, the thing is, is like uh, if you once you figure out your system. You're not perplexed when you hop on a website and it's got 90 different options. Now that doesn't mean you won't experiment later, but if I if I shred something, mm-hmm. I know what I need to replace it with. I know it's tried and true, it's proven. And so when you figure out your system, um, you know you can email us. We can help you out if you're hunting Alaska. Email somebody out there. But um, you know you figure out your pants, your base layer, um, you know your intermediate layer, puffy, whatever. And then don't go like, you know, bat shit crazy and order everything the company makes. Order what's going to suit your purpose for the hunt hunting style that you, you that you do. What piece of gear? On I'll share my experience. What 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 were some of the your favorite uh, clothing items you used this year that you just found yourself going back to overnight? You're like, I love that, and you don't leave home without it. Shama hoodie, the Halstead fleece, the Kafaru puffy. Um, I actually can't talk about the other one because it's not out yet. But that Halstead fleece chama hoodie are definitely right up there. Right up there. Yep. Um, I found myself uh, really like I don't like I said before I don't like wearing long johns yeah. from the waist down. Yeah. I, in general, I it just I don't know when I'm going to get too hot and when I'm going to get too cold and and I think it's Brian's like Brian's about to mention the thing I didn't. But go ahead. Right. I'm going to keep it, trying to keep it, uh, but, but, but you, I don't want to take my boots off. Yeah. Puffy, puffy pants is what he's Puffy pants. Too. Yeah. They're money. Yeah. They go over your, your, your total setup. I, I have to take a bathroom break. I'll let Brian go into that because I don't think we're supposed to talk about. I'm not talking about any specific company or brands. Exactly. There's no problem. I'm just here. saying. Nothing to see here. There's a, a, a over pants. What do you call them? Puffy overpants are money. That's that uh, any any company that's producing those or has thought about it, they should because they they're awesome. They just slip on over everything. So when you're freezing to death, um, you know, you're just instantly warm. It's like heaven. And then they come right off and go in your backpack and they're tiny. So puffy pants that go over your normal setup not puffy pants you wear underneath 
Because you got the same problem, man. You got to drop your drawers. You got to then untie your boots, and you're doing all the stuff trying to get them off. I don't want that. I want them just to go over to me like a warm blanket and then come off really quickly and go in my pack. So uh, that was an awesome product that I probably am not supposed to go into a lot of detail on. So that's as much detail as I'm going into. Um, and Aaron is still not back yet. You got to mention the best product you, you use the whole time. The one you're like, yeah, they are. That's the way to go. <clears throat> they don't weigh anything. The only problem is, is the butt ripped out. Like every, there's rips all over mine. They're all duct taped. I was going to bring them. They're in my pack over there and I was going to show them, but I'm not, we're not supposed to talk about them yet. But Aaron and I talk about stuff. We're not supposed to talk about all the time. And those companies should just thank us for that. <laughs> are we supposed to talk about these? These are on their website. Yeah, we can talk about the gloves. Um, so, so those are the aliens. Is that what they call them? That's what I call That's them. That's what you I'm, call I'm them. Gonna, I'm going to grab my other ones out of the pack. Aren't these bear claws or something? What are they? The polar bears. What the do they call I these? Have, these? So here's my This thing, is First right? Light's glove. It's like a mitten with a crab claw. So that, to me, says alien. <laughs> all right? There's no animal that looks like that. I'm going to grab the polar bears. Okay. As we all know on the Coke commercial... They got a polar bear, right? They got to yes. hold it. So I'm going to grab the polar bears. So these are the other glove that I found myself in extreme cold conditions loving this glove. And uh, it's got a little hook right here for those that are watching on the inner glove. That's like, uh, and I, I don't know if it's like wool in there or what, but, and you slip this thing on. And like Aaron said, you're, you, you still have the, your, your pointer finger and your thumb that can move independent, but the other three are like in a mitten. Your pinky, your ring finger, and your middle finger are all kind of kept in place, so you have that ability to adjust your binoculars or whatever. And at first when I saw this, I'm like, I'm never going to wear that. Why wouldn't I just wear, you know, five-finger gloves? But what happened was there's a certain temperature range where things just get so cold that your hands are perpetually frozen, and, and no matter what you do, they're just cold, and you're always trying to put... You're always uh, sticking them back in your pocket with um, – and this is primarily for glassing is when, when I had them out. I was just using them constantly for glassing. Um, I wouldn't really do it if I was trying to shoot a gun, of course. But they slipped right off, but they just kept my hands so much warmer than any other glove I've ever worn before. And they've my daughter got this, cleaned my room, which pretty much makes it I can't find anything. You can't find it. They're just giant ice. They're like mittens. For, and they're first for, light too. The, no, the mittens that I have uh -huh. really are difficult to find. I really? mean, they're they're black diamonds. Okay. Now, it, why mittens? Why not a five finger glove? Uh, well, with mittens, most of the time when people that that have issues with their hands like I do, your finger gets cold in a five finger glove, even like those yeah. big ice climbing gloves. So the mitten is the same thing as when you take your fingers. When your hands are really cold and you pull your fingers out and you ball them up in the main hand section, what it is is heat is generating throughout the entire section, meaning heat from every finger is going into the same place, heat from the heat. hand. Yeah. Where when you stick your fingers up you the finger just holes, your middle finger heating up the space that the middle finger's in. It's just not enough. And in my case, I fought too much when I was younger and I have no blood flow in my hands, which you've seen. Yeah. They turn purple. I can't even light a lighter. I, your so hands I are worse than mine. I have to be very mindful about um, my hands or I'll get myself into trouble. Um, I, this this glove is just sort of that mi that mixture between... The, the uh, thing that's nice... Let me mm, see one of those. Yeah. Um, this is kind put of it on, the huh? best Because it makes worlds. you feel awesome. Yeah, so, I, I put them on, I was like, I feel like a boxer. So what's cool is you can take this finger and do the same what's thing. What's this where you finger have for those that are listening? Oh, your, pointer your index finger? finger. And it'll fit into this other three brothers. I don't know what those yeah. fingers are called. Your flip-off finger, the high hard one <laughs> finger, the pinky, and that other middle <laughs> ring finger. And you can fit your index finger in the pocket with the other ones to get all the heat. It'll actually, oh. you can fit them all in there. So you can just you, you can do, turn it into a mitt. 
Yeah, it's a mitten. A true now, mitten. Now, if you make a fist for you watching, <laughs> this no matter what a you renegade. do, the, the index po- finger is sticking up because there's nothing. I like to there. call it the pointer finger. Yeah, the pointer, the nose picker. It's a renegade. It's all by itself because there's no finger in it actually. Not now. And then when it, you know, when I need to do something, you just pop it over. Just pull it over, and, you and look. Get... Now I have the pointer finger working again. And you can work the dial on the top of your binos or on your. Uh... I David Copperfield the <laughs> shit out of that. <laughs> Um, so you know what I like, Aaron? Huh. See this, this oh, uh, belt. Snot. It's for snot, yeah. isn't it? It's I, a snot wiper. It's a snot wiper. I thought that that was genius because that's what it is. No yeah. question. This yeah, is no, all like waterproof cool. stuff. Yeah. And then you got the snot wiper, which is important. Now these are. I had a set of gloves like this from uh, a company I can't remember for ice fishing. Mm-hmm. Um. And they, it might have been Black Diamond. I don't know. But what's cool to see is the hunting companies making these. Now. Yeah. I mean, it's very important. This has, I don't know what you talked about while I was going potty, but the wool inner liner of It is this, wool then. Yeah. It's like sheep's wool. You, this comes out. So you can. Well, care, care, take my glove apart. You better be able to put it back together. Whammy. Um so now you wow. just have the, the internal portion. So one of the things that's nice about this is if you're worried your hot hands are going to gonna pop out, throw your hot hand in the main or the outer shell, the waterproof and, shell. And you're talking about a hot hand is a uh, – Ex- It's an external heat source. It's just this little uh, – it's a little bit smaller than a wallet. Um, Those little yeah. shake bags that – yeah, I'm like not a chemist, but there's two things in there, and when it hits oxygen, yep. it gets warmer. And then you can put the glove on your internal glove, and then when this Velcro's, it holds that hot hand in place yep. so it won't fall out, which is nice. Um, and again, it is, as weird as it seems, just having that index finger and the opposable thumb, you can get quite a bit done with yep. that in cold weather. I loved this glove. It was a surprising, I mean, when I first looked at it, I was like, nah, I won't like it. And then I used it, and I was like, wow, this is actually a But it's the really alien, man. <laughs> Live it long is. and prosper. I like it. Except I'm missing the middle <laughs> finger. So let's move. We're going. So uh, the overpants, those the are overpants. awesome, too. Now so Those the, are two things I really liked. And then uh, I'm with you, I'm the Chama hoodie. Yeah. I use that it's good. all the time. Um, the thing with overpants is I've been using overpants, puffy pants, forever. Um, it started off. I have mountaineering friends, you know, mm-hmm. and you go about the time you feel tough, go with a guy that's climbed Everest somewhere <laughs> and he'll knock you down several levels. Um, he's generally going to look like a trustafarian, maybe, or maybe not. He's going to have some veins coming out of the side of his forehead and he's going to hike up the, he's just going to crush you and he's going to actually know more than you and then humble you. And then you're going to actually learn from him. And the first thing I went hiking <laughs> with a guy that had just summited Everest and cold weather, we were snowshoeing. We stopped. I had long johns on. Um, we stopped for lunch. It was pretty, um, yeah, 18 degrees maybe, 15 degrees. Um, I stopped, had nothing on but long johns in my pants. I was sweaty from the long johns. He pulled out puffy pants, threw them on. And uh, me being, you know, the tough guy that I was, um, I'm shaking like a dog in peach pits and he is warm as can be he pulled out those hot hands threw them in the warm pants he sits there he's making soup and coffee i'm doing everything i can to function as a normal human (laughs) and not sound you know like i have tourette's it's bad and so that was probably 10 years ago yeah i've worn them ever since i call them me personally i call them glassing pants and so Mm -hmm. when i set up my pack especially for cold weather i always have my glassing pants and my puffy jacket and a thick face mask all in the same section because I stop and that goes on. We just experienced that on that fourth season hunt. Yeah. Now, when I went to BC on the grizzly hunt, we haven't talked about that hunt. Um, that hunt there wasn't uh, super extreme, but it snowed a lot. It was very, very cold. Um, it was rainy. It was snowy. And if I was going to do that again, I would have definitely – I would have brought different or warmer clothing. Um, there, honestly, I would have brought hot hands. I would have packed hot hands in. It was it was difficult for me to sit there for that long and and that and that cold of weather to glass. And that's all we were doing was yeah. glassing. And these are the things. And we don't need to go in in, in too much more depth. Um, but the things I think people need to consider 
is five of the right pieces of, of clothing will go farther by far than 15 of the wrong pieces of clothing. What do you so, mean by that? Meaning if, if somebody grabs a soft shell, for example, they're not useless by any means. They're not really built for backpack hunting. But let's say you buy um, a rel- relatively lightweight, um, like a base layer T-shirt, and then you buy a lightweight one, long sleeve to go over that, and then you buy like, oh, it's just some kind of a fleece jacket to go over that, and then you buy like a, a piece of um, like a, uh, I don't know what a good example, some kind of a hoodie, like a polyester hoodie, you would actually be warmer with one really good puffy jacket and a t-shirt than you would with all of those at the same time. Now, you can't dress up and dress down as well, but if you get a solid base layer, a solid intermediate, a solid puffy jacket, so on and so forth, by the time it's all said and done, you're only going to have four or five uh, layers for your top for any conditions, but and, and they may cost you a little bit more, but those five layers are going to be able to withstand just about anything rather than saying, oh, this really lightweight jacket's on sale, this lightweight puffy, I'm going to get this. Well, it might work in September, but it may not work in November. And and that's what I mean. If you really kind of decipher, you know, the goods, bads, and everything else, you can get away with five pieces of, of gear for up top and get away with just about anything. You just want to make sure you get the right five. When a puffy Makes jacket sense. is very important for that. Yep. No, I think the puffy's huge. So um, tell me about uh, glassing in extremely cold weather in fourth season Colorado, which we just did. Uh, well. Because I want to get, because one of my favorite things is the wooby. Yeah, so <laughs> again, I work for Kafaru, but the wooby and the um and for whatever reason, I have trouble saying it because it reminds me of a pothead, but the doobie, which is a double whoopie, it's as simple as it sounds. It's double <laughs> insulation. Um, we'll just call it the double whoopie for hey, a, um But people might go on the website and look for it, and it's called a doobie. Aaron. It is called a doobie. Um, what can I say? Uh, <laughs> but it, it's it's a survival blanket. It's, it's, um, it's the same as a poncho liner in the military, same principle, but mm-hmm. the... Um, the outer layer or the shell is colandered, and so what colandered means is is it extremely wind resistant. Um, it's a continuous filament, so there's no baffles in it, so you don't lose any uh, body heat or no wind comes in through stitch holes, which happens with down. So it's extremely windproof. It's extremely durable, and the insulation that we use is extremely warm. It, it compresses down. Uh, very very small my daughter uses it for her bed that's it's funny mm-hmm. we i was like you want me to get a comforter and she's like no i use my whoopee she likes the whoopee everybody likes the whoopee suzanne loves the whoopee she's confiscated my whoopee i i mean i actually um i leave one in my truck uh for like a survival blanket the the, the biggest thing you need to remember when you're going into potential extreme cold weather conditions is you may not have a, clothing may not be enough it, it just in my case, it's not. Especially if you're sitting still. And exposed sitting still. In the case we had, glassing, the best glassing point was relatively exposed. We you're you're basically at the tip top of some rock formation exposed, and you're getting buffeted from the wind in every direction, plus it's cold. Which that happened to us, and we sat for four to five hours. At a time, maybe so, longer. Oh, yeah. Um, and so what I do, and what Brian does as well, John Pinch... I pull out the whoopee. I have hot hands in the different parts of my, my body that I need. Usually I have them up here um, in like my, uh, what would you call that? Your side, your hand pocket? It's like a hand pocket. In um, what? The, the parka? In the jacket. In the parka. Yeah. I have them in the parka. There's a kangaroo I, pocket kind of in the front. A big yeah, giant pocket. There we go. We'll call it the kangaroo. In the kangaroo of the, the, the Lost Park parka. I have them in there. I generally have them in my pants, like my, my, my hand pockets in my pants. And sometimes I'll have them in my gloves as well. And then I wrap that whoopee around me. I wrap, I take my boots off or I'll loosen up my boots. I wrap it around my feet so I'm fully blocked from the wind Mm -hmm. and then i just kind of manufacture my tripod legs around that and then that body heat i have plus the heat from the hot hands or the external heat source is generally it's just bouncing between the whoopee and my body 
um, in my clothing, and so it's just a big hot box, which it wasn't that cold most days we were up there. No. It wasn't horrible. But when you left, John and I were still there. It was cold. And there were a couple of days where it was, uh, you know, nine degrees or below where we were up there. It was by far colder on one of those days when you weren't there. And uh, I ended up taking, you know, of course, I put on the parka. And I also have the Uncompagre. Yeah. First lights, puffy, underneath that. And parka on top, the Kafaru parka. And then on the bottom, you know, I have my... My over pants, my puffy pants. And what I found was surprising to me was how cold my feet get inside boots. Oh, dude, it's, I have to, I, so I have down booties, uh, believe so it or not. So did John Pinch. Well, it's because he stole that idea from me. You show offs yeah. have these down <laughs> booties, and I'm like, how stupid is that? You got boots on. How, why would you need a booty over top of a boot? And then I, I, I became a believer. But one thing I did in place of that, in lieu of it, was I just put the parka, I wrapped it all the way around my bottom half, including my boots. Yeah. And then I plopped down, and there's no place where there wasn't snow. So I'm in the snow with the parka yeah. and the, the wooby wrapped around me, and my boots covered and everything, and I'm glassing, and I'm in, like in heaven. Yeah. And uh, I got to admit, the, uh, the parka, the, the, no, um, for some reason, maybe it was just the insulation, or but uh, the snow did not melt through or get through the the uh, or get the the will be wet. Yeah, it generally doesn't. And it kept my feet super warm because it's like wearing a booty. It takes a lot to get through that outer layer. It was um, amazing. Well, I mean, we we have it coated afterwards or uh-huh. we can, but uh, when it, with with. It is true. There is a reason why it's so expensive, though. It's a pain in the butt to build. It's heavy duty. We'll pour water on that and make a bowl, and it'll take a significant amount of time to leak. It wouldn't matter if the insulation gets wet anyway. Um, That's what I figured. So I wrapped it all the way around, and I'm cozied up, and I'm looking. And something I brought this trip, I usually do hot hands and stuff, yeah. and you do this different the different shapes. Zippo shakes. deal. Huh? But I, I bought the Zippo, the, yeah. big, the bigger, heavier-duty Zippo. Which you put a little bit of fuel in. It takes tiny bit. The can fuel canisters are about three dollars, and I think it'll run that Zippo for about a week. Yeah, maybe maybe two weeks, maybe a week and a half. But it runs twelve hours with each fill up. Yeah, and I think I used it uh, all like six days. I used it six days, and I think I um, still have a little over half a can. So I, I would think it lasts almost two weeks. Yeah, um, but it's a little silver Zippo hand warmer. Uh, the only thing that I noticed about it was it didn't um, get as hot as your the hand, big hot hands. The big hot hands do. I don't, I don't mess around anymore. I get the body warmer hot hands. Me I don't too. Get the hand. So if I get a body warmer hot hand, it doesn't quite compete. Yeah. But by itself, it's definitely warmer than a small one. Yeah. And uh, but it does run twelve hours, you know, twelve thirteen hours nonstop, and. Um, you know, it was inexpensive, and I always had fuel, you know, so I fill it up in the morning, and it's going to last me all day. It was nice. I well, liked it. And we, t- we have brought It stinks, this, though. It does, it, I wouldn't say it stinks. It, I like the smell of it. I don't think deer will like the smell of it. That's what I was going to say <laughs> is it kind of has, a, like, a fuel, a kerosene fuel smell. It's very yeah. mild. Yeah. But you can pick it up when you pull it out of your pocket here and there. You get a whiff of it here and there. It's not offensive at all. It's, like, it's minor. But still, if I'm in a tree stand hunting blacktails, there's no way I'm bringing that. Yeah, I, I'm I going mean, with. I'm yeah. going with something. We're, we're rifle hunting. If I'm bow hunting, I don't think I'm bringing that. I'm I'm using, you know, sh- portable hot hands. Yeah, throw away disposable I, hot hands. And I mean, you don't really take. I think you take for granted. I don't know if "take for granted" is the right word. Until you've been in really bad trouble with. Uh, with cold weather, you don't really take into consideration small things that may help, like a whoopee or a zippo or hot hands. And and some people, and I mean some, until you've done like a ten day, seven day backpack hunt and experienced just a true shit show of bad weather, you're not really going to probably take into consideration what may keep you alive and. We weren't in our lives weren't in jeopardy this year, but there were certain times where I'm like, "Wow, I'm really glad I have this." And there's other times I'm thinking, "Wow, I really need screw this," up. and I didn't bring it. Yeah, that one morning, the worst morning was the one where 
uh, you were wet. Your feet were wet. We we we. This was elk season. I was shaking so uncontrollably for what, probably forty minutes. Yeah, the things we do to kill something, right? Right, like we were on the edge. Of, we thought we were. We thought we had a money spot, and we we were just waiting for that bull to walk into the opening. But just sitting still, and it was just so cold, so cold in the morning. My feet were wet. Yeah, and Aaron just got to a point where his temperature seemed to just drop, and then just couldn't get back up. I couldn't. I mean, I literally was like. <laughs> And I went over to Brian. I was like, we got to move. Well, Brian is warmer than me, and we make it about 200 yards, and Brian's like, hey, what do you think about we go up here? And uh, I, with my teeth chattering, I'm like, you don't effing get it. I'm effing done. <laughs> that's we because, have got to move that's now. because you don't complain. Yeah. So Aaron's inwardly dying, but he hasn't said anything. He's Mr. Stoic. So uh, we're walking back to camp, and I'm looking at him like, oh, he looks pretty good. Oh, I think, I, Aaron, I think there's elk on the hill. Let's go up there. And you looked at me like, you don't get it. <laughs> I, I and then we got back to camp, and you got a fire going. and We dried everything off. Yeah. And, yeah, and then that whole day even into, until the next morning. My core had dropped. Yeah, you, it, you looked warm. like you had aged 10 years, and you had no energy. Yeah, it's and that's sucked. the risk I think that people don't realize is when you you get exposed or you allow yourself to get that cold, uh, well, it and, takes and a toll. My problem, which has always been no brains, no headaches, right? I can I can suffer with the best of them, <laughs> and I will suffer so long and so hard. I will put my life in jeopardy out of ignorance. Basically, I could have easily said, Brian, we need to move, but when you when you it obviously is important for you to get an animal. We had sat there that long. I'm thinking, what's 45 more minutes? Well, then it's like, what's 30 more minutes? Well, then I'm shivering uncontrollably and my jaw's hurting because I'm clenching my mouth so much and I can't feel any part of my feet at all. And my hands are so cold. I'm to the point now where I can't tell which finger I'm touching with my thumb. Yeah. And it got to about 15 minutes after that. And I'm like, I had trouble packing my bag. I'm like, Brian, we got to move. Yeah. Well, he still didn't know how cold I was until he said that. And I'm like, dude, I'm serious. I'm hitting hypothermia. <laughs> then I got it. I was like, yeah. oh, we better start marching. <laughs> yeah, it was. And but, I was having trouble walking because I couldn't feel my feet. And that's when I built that fire because I knew yeah. my body core, my core temperature was in trouble. And you're right. Like we got back and you said, dude, you look like you're 10 years older. Yeah. And I couldn't, I slept that day throughout the day. Most of the day. was in my bag. So. Anthony is a lot like you in that regard. I've seen him just tough it out all day long, like in a blacktail tree stand in the Cascades. Yeah. And it's freezing and he wasn't warm enough and he sat still all day, didn't drink any water. Yeah. And all of a sudden, and he's just like, whatever it takes to kill this big buck. Yeah. And then we climb out and we get in the truck and then he's in convulsions and we pull over and he's dry vomiting on the road. Yeah, yep. And then we're <laughs> rushing him to the hospital and they get in there and they rush him in. They're like, he's severely dehydrated and his organs are shutting down. You're like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Dude, I've, like, pissed, I've <laughs> pissed blood before, not trying to compete with it, but... Yeah, when you pee blood from not drinking water, you've hit a dumb shit level above all others. <laughs> That's like, why I'm like, I don't, I don't understand because when I get to the point where it's like that, I'm just like, screw this, I'm done. But yeah. you and Anthony have another level of drive and 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 determination and stupidity that I don't really. <laughs> it does boil down to stupidity. I mean, all of you thinking, man, that's crazy that Aaron and Anthony are that tough. It's not cool. I can. <laughs> I have been so close to death. Before. I mean, and it sounds over dramatic, but I have been so low on hunts where I have been so cold, I couldn't build a fire. I couldn't physically light a lighter. So the only option you have at that point is pray you can walk and warm your body well, up. Well, when you know you're that tough, you're gonna, you, you've got to, I think you've, like I'm just not, so I'm I'm okay with that. I'm okay with not being that tough. I'll 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 be, I'll be like, okay, this has got to stop. But when you're that tough, you gotta have the self discipline to say, you know, enough's enough. Let's cut this short before I get to this downward spiral. And um, I have not. I have many times not <laughs> done that. And the the thing that um, why I think I'm so not anal, but maybe hard headed. Well, well, I'm definitely that, but steadfast <laughs> on the gear list and try to 
let people know what they should bring is that I have been in a position where maybe I have not yeah. brought that. And, and, and I mean, I, I, I have been in just about every situation you could possibly be in from falling through ice into rivers to, you know, whatever the case yeah. may be that there were times where I'm like, I may not make it out of this, you know, like, wow, why did I do this to myself? I remember I was too poor to buy neoprene waders. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I used to <laughs> fish with a float tube with no, with in shorts and in very cold weather. That and seems flippers. foolish. And I remember getting out of the water multiple times and I was stumbling out of the float tube, but I wanted to fish and I couldn't afford neoprene waders. Yeah. And so when, when, when I do get a kick and I generally don't reply to them when guys are like, oh, you, you guys are rich, you're spoiled. Well, maybe now, but I didn't used to always be rich. And, uh, and if you're tough department. enough, you can do it. I yeah. mean, you can get it done. One thing that I think <clears throat> is undervalued, maybe the whitetail market seems to get this more than the Western hunting because they're sitting in some cold, cold tree stands uh and just sitting there still so i think they they often get that whole um warmth thing figured out yeah uh but an external heat source to me is highly underrated yeah uh when you have hot hands or a zippo lighter those are things where you can get warmth without having to internally generate it right and sometimes when your temperature goes as low as yours did it's not generating it, anything. It's not going to generate it. <laughs> you need something from the outside to warm you up, some external heat source. And that's where th- packing a, uh, some of those is really nice. The other thing is trioxane tablets and fire starting. Yeah, building a fire. You are a fire-making fool, and it's the difference between, I mean, man, can it improve your mood, your attitude, your motivation? Just It's like it's, it's a mountain blaze- man television. Dude, a blazing <laughs> fire is just like... I rule the world. You know, there's just a, a certain confidence thing that comes back. I'll survive. I can do this. Something about warmth like that. And the same thing with a wall tent. You know, when we came back in Coeur d'Alene after being drenched for two days on a spike camp. Yeah. Man, and you walked across the river waist deep without taking your boots or pants off because you were so I did, wet. I did get good photos of Brian <laughs> crossing the river. And it was funny because I squatted down to get a lower angle. And then I could feel the water hitting the hang down, and it didn't matter because I was like, I can't get any wetter than I am. So I just squatted in the water and got yep. it's pretty epic photos of you crossing. Dude, I, I was still dry, so I was like, I ain't going <laughs> in, you know. But but definitely um, the uh, fire makes a difference, and that's where I think, although I have not, it's funny, I have never used a Kafaru shelter with a stove yet. Yeah. Uh, it just never happened this season, but using a wall tent with a stove and ex- extrapolating that experience into what it would be like in a backcountry situation with a teepee and a stove, man, I, I just, man, having a stove I, and being I, able to dry your stuff, that's a game changer. I can tell you on the, on the BC, the grizzly hunt, mm-hmm. we would have been effed up like a soup sandwich if we didn't have the sawtooth and stove specifically me because it was about as cold as you can get and i'm trying to stay positive about the trip because we're not seeing bears and and uh you know it's not like i'm sure we could have made it without the stove but when you are eight to 12 miles in and you're cold and you're soaking wet and then you in 15 minutes have it 80 degrees to the point like Cal was sitting in the, cause we all three hung out in the same, in the yeah. sawtooth. I mean, literally Cal, like I'm broke back mountaining the, the <laughs> crap out of it. I'm down to my undies and a t-shirt, just stoking that thing. I like it hot. Well, and he's giving me crap about it. I can sleep in <laughs> when it's pretty hot. Yes. Um, and I mean, literally warming everything up. I have drying everything out to a point where I'm like, I'm going to suck in every bit of this heat I can, even though it's hotter than I really want it, because tomorrow I'm going to freeze to death. And so that's a game changer. There's no way yeah. around it. I bring a super tarp and a Smith cylinder stove in the spring a lot solo. And uh, we all go on these big trips. You'll go on them. Mm-hmm. And we, we backpack in and we bring these shelters and, and literally the one year Colton fell in after Colton fell in, off this log, I'm like... In the water. Yeah, fell in the water, rolled down, 
And Colton took it like a man. Like he <laughs> he came up to that log. And I may not be afraid of heights, but I'm afraid of falling off a log into a river. And I'm like, I don't know if I can make that. Colton, no hesitation. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Straight on, he makes it almost all the way across, and he gets a little wobbly. And we're not talking like an old growth, right? We're talking a pecker pole, right? Small. <laughs> and he grabs this branch, and it breaks, and he falls in. And I see him rolling down, and he gets on the other side. He's like, the stick broke. <laughs> and I was like, my fat ass is not getting on that log. <laughs> I'll just go across. Well, then I'm like, I'll barefoot it. Yeah. I, I, I have feet like a two-year-old baby. So <laughs> You do have tender feet. I just walked across with everything on. And I. the reason why we were able to do that is we knew we had mm-hmm. the stoves. Other than that, I don't know that we wouldn't be able to stay the night because it – while we're talking about this, another squirrel, Dave Ziegman brings a Tenkara rod, right? Colton is like Brad Pitt. From River runs through it with a beard and four inches taller, he's slaying the fish, right? Mm-hmm. Well, Ziegman is a fly fisherman, uh, but he brought a tin car rod, which is basically like bringing a paper clip to a machine gun fight, right? He's got a stick. So Dave is naked, chest deep, to get farther out in this water, fishing with yeah. a tin car rod, where Colton is on land dry, spooling it, right? Just right. slaying fish. <laughs> And me, I'm warm now, so I have a torpedo bobber, and I'm on the edge watching this. Thinking, <laughs> this is—I got pictures of them in the yeah. snow. But the thing, like Dave got out, we had a fire going. I don't know how he didn't freeze to death. That man has amazing thresh. He's the one with like three ankles, one growing out, like eighteen knee surgeries. He broke his leg. He does the R and D for Yeti mountain bikes. Uh-huh. The guy's insane on a bike. He broke his leg. For for those of you watching, this area here below his knee, below his knee, and it's spinning right, like, and he's riding. He has to ride back, so I oh. think they ended up duct taping that bastard to the cross member, <laughs> so he could get back. And so, and then I think they duct taped it, but they said the guy I, the, was behind him when he was riding. Since that thing's swinging <laughs> a couple of times, it hit rocks. It was like, <laughs> and it spun around. Dave's a tough individual, uh, extremely tough. Ow. So, but Dude, the, that's wrong. There's certain things when think. Well, not the leg broken. That generally doesn't happen on a hunt. But to stay warm, stuff to build a fire, the survival blanket, things like that are are important. Um, I mean, after that, the fourth season hunt, same kind of stuff we used in BC. The wooby was important. Puffy uh-huh. pants, puffy top, things like that. What was your favorite hat? Oh, that the merino beanie from First Light. By far, that's my favorite hat. The I wear it constantly. I wore it today. Uh, the lucky one now, the primitive uh, merino beanie was my favorite hat. And I don't um, – I'm a beanie guy. I wear one all the time yeah. anyway. But that merino beanie is pretty nice. I also like um, the beanie – the hats that um, – the, the I, I think it's called Happy Creatures – um that yeah. lady made that yeah, not, yeah, a, yeah. not a hunting hat but she's hunter friendly she custom made the ones with the ears yeah that hat's another one i wear when it's um when it's colder I, yeah it's happy creatures i thought she was an anti-hunter <laughs> right and she was liking my photos i'm like and so i started looking into it and she made these yeah bear hats for kids yeah well i had her made a bunch for adults and we wore them on the bear hunt to be ding dongs and kaylee has one yep. and anyway um, those are great hats. I love that hat. And it's, it's kind of cool cause it's handmade. I have, I, I like the first light hat, but it's really tight and I, I really can't stand a hat that cuts off circulation. Yeah. Uh, and so I wear, I like this cheap solo hunter beanie, my mountain ops beanie. I actually like the cheap ones cause they just, they're just loose and they, they, they fit well. Brian may be leaving out. He loses a lot of things too. I so. do lose a lot of hats. So I don't. I don't like them beanies. I tend to lose beanies, so I, I don't like them to be too expensive. Not to throw Brian under the brush. <laughs> Brian lost a Sony A7S S <laughs> two and one to four hundred lens recently. Lost is a strong word. Misplaced for a while. Like two days. I was starting to panic. It's like only a six thousand dollar setup with the with the yeah. adapters and the the doubler and I just recently learned Lance Manning has my binoculars. I was sure hey. I lost those. Yeah, I'm, I'm just as bad as Brian. I've never lost the camera. I've lost some spotters for a month or two. What I did is I lent them to a buddy. Couldn't remember who I lent them to. Yeah. And then I needed it. No idea who I lent it. I got to get a list on the, yeah. the man cave. But. I do have a balaclava, right? Not a baklava. 
I baklava is a dessert. I call it a block of lava. <laughs> I'm sure it's wrong, but it's a fuzzy face mask. Yeah, I have uh, one of those, and when I'm really cold, and I don't even know what brand. I, I wouldn't mind getting a higher quality one. I bought that one years ago at Cabela's on some bargain cave thing, but it's just got a hole. It's just a ski mask. Yeah. But I got to admit, in Alberta, when the wind was whipping really hard and my nose was running bad, and I've we were just the, glassing, it was uh, nice to put that on and just have the eyes poking out. I had the first light one, which is super warm. Oh, yeah. I needed it that first day when I was sitting there in the with the fog. Yep. Uh, it, it was bad. I did wear that first light one that uh, it's just the neck gaiter that yeah. you can pull up. I do like that one a lot, too. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the Chama hoodie's right up there. It's um, handy. Yeah. Uh, anything else? No, I don't think so. We should probably stop talking. I have to buy groceries and get dinner tonight. So that's our clothing kind of update podcast uh yeah i mean i think we'll probably touch on it again in another month when we've seen maybe two months i guess when we've seen some of the newer stuff from the shows we'll go um, to ata yeah go to ata we've 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 got a lot of stuff we've gotten to see we can't talk about as well or some stuff until the ata when it's released but <laughs> it is important to buy have good clothing i think one of the takeaways here is don't buy a million pieces of year yeah. Buy the layering system that works for you that, you know, from, so you can wear that stuff from all, all the different temperature ranges and then exertion levels. Yep. Yeah, um, for sure. And, uh, an external heat source is great. Yep. If you can engineer, or come up with some of those, whether that's in your tent with a stove or, you know, hot hands, hot hands or lighter or something like that. Um, and, uh, Yeah. You got our spiel. Yeah, that's it. So, all right. Well, thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and uh, stay gritty. Stay gritty. In 1907, only 41,000 elk remained in North America, and in 1950, only 12,000 pronghorn remained. Today, there are more than 1 million elk and 1.1 million pronghorn. Why? Because hunting is conservation. In 1937, hunters actually requested an 11% tax on guns, ammo, bows, and arrows to help fund conservation. That tax so far raised more than $8 billion for wildlife conservation. Altogether, hunters pay more than $1.6 billion a year for conservation programs. No one gives more. It's obvious that hunters care about animals, and yet we actively hunt and kill them. Many people cannot understand this dichotomy. How can we both care about animals and also kill them? It's a question that I challenge all of you to consider. Here is an excerpt from the Gritty Bowman film, Alberta, with a quote from Fred Bear that describes my feelings on this subject. The first shot on this buck was fatal, and it cleanly pierced his vitals, but he didn't go down. I hate to see animals suffer, and when possible, I will always shoot them again if I have the opportunity. I have tremendous respect for this buck and his will to survive. He didn't go down easy, and I have mixed emotions about that. At times like this, I am reminded of a quote by Fred Bear, which somewhat describes my thoughts on this matter. Quote, I have always tempered my killing with respect for the game pursued. I see the animal not only as a target, but as a living creature with more freedom than I will ever have. I take that life if I can, with regret as well as joy and with the sure knowledge that nature's way of fang and claw and starvation are a far crueler fate than I bestow. I do not hunt for the joy of killing, but for the joy of living, and the inexpressible pleasure of mingling my life, however briefly, with that of a wild creature that I respect, admire, and value. We can argue as much as we like, but the fact is, hunting is man's oldest and most successful try at life. Every human being is alive today because our ancestors hunted. So it's a relatively new phenomenon for people to regard hunting as a cruel and frivolous activity that has no worth outside of personal gratification for the hunter. The funny thing is, hunting has increased my appreciation for wild animals and wild places, not decreased it. And as I watch society lose its ties to wildlife and conservation, I feel my bond with nature grow ever stronger in direct correlation to my time spent hunting. I understand now more than ever that hunting is the greatest hope for creating the next generation of true conservationists. Never stop sharing your passion for hunting in the outdoors. 
Our wild animals and wild places depend on it. We thank Kefaru Mountain Ops, Hoyt, Vortex, Phelps Game Calls, Black Eagle Arrows, and Crispy Boots for supporting the Gritty Bowman. We love these companies and the people behind them. They truly make fantastic products. Please support them however you can. As always, good luck on your hunts and stay gritty. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. <laughs>